No, we're good. Good, good morning. Um, briefly, my name is Phil Stein. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist, uh, practiced in the Orlando area um, for way too long, about 40 years. Um, and I come to you this morning um, from ODARC 30 in California. Um, the sun will rise here shortly. Um, and we're going to talk about um, abnormal liver tests. Um, uh, I have practiced uh, to a large degree um, hollow organ gastroenterology, but also um, liver disease, uh, including uh, running a liver transplant uh, program. Uh, next slide. Um, briefly, uh, I have no disclosures. And next slide. And uh, Chris has already talked to you about um, uh, CME credits. Okay. Next slide. Um, so uh, my goal, again, is not to have you be treating all liver disease, but to raise your knowledge, um, increase your diagnostic ability, um, and help you make educated referrals when appropriate, um, and be an educated partner with hepatology. Um, it, I, I don't know your particular uh, situation, but there probably is a um, transplant center um, close to you, uh, maybe in the Boston area. Um, and I, I think it's a very good idea for um, primary care providers um, to become uh, somewhat familiar with a local hepatologist that they can um, do curbside uh, consults when necessary and refer when necessary. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, uh, um, talk about is um, what do we talk about when we talk about liver tests? Um, and uh, I think that for the most part, um, lab that people usually um, call LFTs or liver function tests are, are in, in fact not a measure of function. Um, and I think that's important. Um, there are scans that uh, most of you, I'm sure, are quite familiar with uh, ultrasound, CT, and MR. There are also some non-invasive tests um, that help gauge uh, damage to the liver. Um, one is lab test-based called FIB4. One is elastography, um, and uh, that is uh, a ultrasound-based um, uh, test using a special a probe, and also MR um, can be used um, to measure um, stiffness, and and which equates to fibrosis. Um, liver biopsy and uh, vascular pressures um, are invasive and uh, have some risk, though the risk is fairly minimal. Um, we try, um, when possible, to avoid uh, doing biopsies. Next slide. Um, so let's talk about liver injury tests. Um, AST and ALT are, are enzymes, um, which are in particularly high concentration um, in uh, hepatocytes, in liver cells. Um, ALT is a little more specific um, for liver than AST. Um, AST is also in um, moderate uh, amounts in muscle, um, as an example. Uh, so um, uh, we think of uh, ALT as being a little more specific. Alkaline phosphatase is really a unique um, uh, uh, enzyme in that it's an inducible enzyme, meaning um, it's actually on the hepatocyte um, membrane. Um, and when pressure is applied to that portion of the cell membrane, um, alkaline phosphatase um, increases in amount and therefore in the blood. So localized pressure from a tumor or pressure on the bile duct um, actually makes more alkaline phosphatase be produced. Gamma GT is somewhat similar to alkaline phosphatase um, and is also uh, generally more of a pressure phenomenon, um, but is uh, I, I actually don't use a lot um, and uh, stick mostly with alkaline phosphatase. Um, in most liver disease, 
the ALT is going to be higher than the AST, except in alcohol. And that can oftentimes be a clue as to whether or not the patient um, is using excessive alcohol. Next slide. Um, Billy Rubin, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, is uh, a breakdown product of hemoglobin. So there's a lot of factors that can cause elevation, including um, uh, hemolysis. Um, Prothrombin time um, usually uh, discusses PTINR, so um, an international uh, ratio which allows labs to uh, normalize their values, um, is produced by the liver. So it can really actually be a liver function test. Albumin is produced by the liver, but there are many factors that affect albumin level. Um, so uh, while albumin can certainly be low in patients with significant liver dysfunction, there are other reasons for albumin to be low. Next slide, please. So let's look at a differential. Um, I think uh, having a differential uh, list like this uh, can help with uh, our, our differential diagnosis. And um, with infections, I'm mostly talking about viral infections, though there are other infections. And, and certainly, um, uh, you know, if you're in some parts of the world like South Africa, um, amoebic liver abscess um, is uh, unfortunately a, a relatively common um, diagnosis. But for the most part, um, we're talking viral infections. Again, we certainly have um, uh, parasites uh, which can infect uh, the um, liver. Ingestion, um, I include um, prescribed medication, non-prescribed meds or uh, substances that people take as supplements and exposure, um, sometimes uh, industrial toxins um, and um, of course, alcohol. Metabolic comes down mostly to uh, inborn errors of metabolism. Um, and we think mostly of hemochromatosis or uh, which is iron uh, overload and Wilson's disease, which is copper. Autoimmune um, hepatitis is a a fairly common entity seen mostly in women. Some other autoimmune diseases such as uh, lupus can affect the liver. Um, pregnancy is something that um, should really be uh, a thought of when thinking about abnormal LFTs. Um, there are some relatively benign uh, problems with the liver in pregnancy, but there are some which are very, very serious. And so um, I make a big deal that uh, any abnormal uh, liver function tests in a uh, woman who is pregnant um, needs very careful evaluation. Systemic illnesses um, sometimes can affect the liver. Um, for example, um, uh, celiac sprue, as an example, and vascular disease, which is unlikely for you all to see an outpatient um, environment uh, is often a uh, vascular collapse, such as post-code um, or uh, major vessel occlusion, such as a uh, hepatic vein um, or a uh, hepatic artery. Uh, next slide. So um, there are really uh, essentially uh, three patterns, hepatocellular, which is mostly AST and ALT elevation, cholestatic alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin um, can be elevated in both. And a lot of times, unfortunately, um, when trying to figure out what's going on, uh, you'll see some degree of, of both hepatocellular and cholestatic um, elevations so that uh, the distinction uh, can be quite blurred. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about infections. Um, uh, briefly, um, uh, a review, uh, hepatitis A, acute, never chronic, fecal oral. Hepatitis B can be acute and chronic. Chronic is usually only about 5% in adults, but vertical transmission, meaning mom to newborn, um, unfortunately, the chronicity is 95%. 
And so in some countries uh, where there is not good control of hepatitis B, there is a lot of vertical transmission and therefore a very high rate of hepatitis B in the population. Hepatitis C has an acute and chronic phase, but 80% of patients who get hepatitis C will have a chronic phase. But again, that's not 100%. Hepatitis D or Delta is a very unusual, incomplete virus that does not have the ability to get into liver cells and infect the liver unless the patient has ongoing hepatitis B, either acute hepatitis B or chronic hepatitis B. Hepatitis E um, is an acute infection, waterborne, very dangerous in women who are pregnant, um, and tends to be a third world infection. Um, most of the infections that we see here in the United States are from people who have traveled uh, and have not gotten hepatitis E here in the United States. And there are a variety of other viruses. Uh, uh, you can see patients with um, of, of first uh, in, infection of uh, herpes type 2, who will have abnormal LFTs, EB virus, um, as an example. So uh, other less hepatic uh, specific viruses um, can cause abnormal uh, liver function tests uh, or liver injury tests, if I'm going to be more correct myself. Um, and these are mostly hepatocellular in their uh, presentation. Next slide. Ingestion. I think the first part here is extremely important. You will see patients who have drug-induced liver injury. You will see a lot of medications, and when you look them up, you'll see that low-grade elevations of AST and ALT are fairly common. But on the other hand, there are prescription medications that we all use on a regular basis that can cause substantial liver injury. Over-the-counter drugs, I'm sure everybody's aware of, of Tylenol acetaminophen as a uh, potential for severe liver injury. The other one uh, that I think a lot of times we don't think about um, is uh, supplements and uh, food additives. Um, again, green tea. I had some last night at a cooking class. Anabolic steroids. See this a lot in young men. They go to um, uh, 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 food stores and get anabolic steroids and uh, they can get a severe, actually usually cholestatic liver injury. It's very hard um, when you've pumped yourself up with some anabolic steroids, helping to get a date and you're jaundiced. It's tough to get a date when you're deeply jaundiced. Um, toxins and chemicals, mushrooms. Um, I make a big deal out of knowing your population. Um, I spent some time in Gainesville, Florida. Um, unfortunately, uh, going out into the um, cow pastures and picking mushrooms that were hallucinogens um, when picking the wrong mushrooms and ending up with liver failure. Um, carbon tetrachloride we no longer uh, have, but is a classic example of um, a uh, chemical uh, that can cause severe liver disease. Next slide. Metabolic, um, steatosis, uh, uh, both uh, uh, common in uh, patients who are overweight, but also seen in some patients who are lean. Um, hemochromatosis, a really common entity, um, if we look for it, uh, iron overload. Wilson's, fortunately, um, pretty uncommon, um, but can cause a severe liver disease and is a disease that has lots of different presentations, including a presentation in um, uh, the pediatric age group, and then that can resolve. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin is very interesting and obviously can affect both um, liver and lung um, and uh, is fairly easy to diagnose um, with uh, blood tests. Um, next slide, please. Autoimmune hepatitis, um, 
a common um, in uh, women um, presents with uh, severe systemic symptoms um, and uh, can present with very, very high AST and ALT. Um, and as mentioned previously, um, there can be some overlap uh, to the liver in uh, both uh, rheumatoid arthritis and um, in systemic lupus. Primary biliary cholangitis, and you may have remembered this uh, disease as being called primary biliary uh, cirrhosis. Um, they changed the name a number of years ago because we're catching this disease a lot earlier um, because of our use of um, CMPs and uh, these present with uh, an elevated alkaline phosphatase. And they can be um, a fairly long asymptomatic um, phase. So isolated alkaline phosphatase um, should be uh, evaluated. And there is relatively good treatment um, which can um, prevent the patient from requiring liver transplant. So evaluating those patients with an isolated alkaline phosphatase, um, even if it's fairly low, um, is a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, next slide, please. And, and then we, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, associated uh, with systemic disease, um, inflammatory uh, bowel disease, especially uh, ulcerative colitis, um, primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is a um, extra hepatic, mostly um, uh, biliary disease, um, celiac disease we mentioned, um, thyroid disease, you will see patients with um, thyroiditis um, who have abnormal LFTs, metastatic cancer um, uh, will usually be cholestatic. And again, this produces pressure and raises the alkaline phosphatase, again, based on this pressure phenomenon. Um, sepsis can give us abnormal LFTs. And granulomatous disease will give us a cholestatic disease, TB and sarcoidosis. And um, sometimes it's going to be very difficult to differentiate between um, the TB and sarcoidosis. Uh, next slide, please. I, I mentioned these, and again, um, it's unlikely you're going to see these in a um, outpatient practice, um, but you will see patients with right-sided heart failure who have um, a congestive hepatopathy, um, usually presenting with some modest AST and ALT elevations, um, and actually some right upper quadrant pain as they have some uh, liver swelling and the um, capsule of the liver um, is where there are some uh, nerve cells. Um, next slide, please. So um, how do we figure out what's going on? I, I think a lot of times um, when I see a patient, uh, the question is, is what got them to get the lab done that shows the abnormal LFTs? Now, in y'all's practice, it may be um, that you simply did a CMP, but um, there may be, have been a specific reason. Um, the patient wasn't feeling well. Uh, there was some um, question uh, about their overall health. A CMP is done, and we see elevation of ALKFOS, uh, AST, or ALT. Um, sometimes uh, there are uh, symptoms which are more suggestive of um, liver disease, and sometimes there are symptoms that aren't so suggestive. Um, I will tell you that in my practice, I will see a couple of times a year a patient who presented to a rheumatologist with joint complaints um, who turns out to have, for example, acute hepatitis B. Not uncommon. Um, uh, getting a birth history. Um, uh, I oftentimes will see patients who have recently emigrated from Haiti, um, where vertical transmission is very common uh, for hepatitis B. Um, I get those referred from the health department. And so knowing the birth history is important. Medications and over-the-counter uh, medications, very, very important to do this in a very detailed fashion. Surgery and or transfusions. Now, transfusions obviously today are much less likely to um, produce uh, 
a uh, problem, though they can, especially if the transfusion was done outside the United States. I have seen um, patients with acute hepatitis uh, B and C from transfusion, specifically in Mexico, um, but it can really be any place else in the world. Uh, again, supplements, this is this whole idea of um, uh, green tea or uh, other over-the-counter supplements. Um, and then, you know, those are the, the common ones that we all know, IV drug use, work, travel history, um, sex uh, exposure, and incarceration. Um, past history and family history, um, very important um, in trying to figure out what's going on, um, especially uh, past history of um, other uh, illnesses, specifically systemic illnesses, again, such as inflammatory bowel disease. Um, next slide, please. So, um, it, in, also in the history, looking for signs of decompensation. Now, this is, could be unusual, but you, you will have patients in your practice who have, unbeknownst to them and to you, um, have underlying liver disease and all of a sudden are in your office with um, decompensation. Um, probably one of the most common is going to be ascites. Um, now, obviously, ascites has other potential etiologies, um, including malignancy, um, but uh, certainly um, it can, uh, these patients can present with decompensation without anybody realizing um, that they had underlying liver disease. Next slide, please. Um, physical exam, um, again, with uh, steatosis being a concern um, for uh, long-term liver disease, um, BMI, and now even more popular is um, waist circumference. Um, tattoos and injection scars, and looking for signs of advanced liver disease, jaundice, spider angioma, um, ascites, and signs of encephalopathy. Um, next slide, please. So um, some of the lab is, is pretty obvious. Um, a CBC with a platelet count, um, probably one of the most telling things of advanced liver disease is um, a low platelet count. Um, I'll see a patient in the emergency room with an upper GI bleed, and you note that their platelet count is 50,000, and um, you uh, quiz them. Uh, they're an 80-year-old woman, and you learn that she had a blood transfusion um, as a result of a complicated pregnancy um, 60 years ago. Um, she's likely to have varices. So um, look at platelet counts. A CMP, obviously, we talked about PT, INR, gamma GT. I, I don't tend to use gamma GT a lot, but it, it's it's out there. A lot of people talk about it. Um, you will see people who try to use it as a marker for alcoholism. I think that's really a bad idea. Um, we could talk about that if people have some questions. Hepatitis A, B, and C markers, uh, obviously. Iron studies, ferritin, um, Realizing, though, that ferritin is an acute phase reactant, so not every patient who has a high ferritin has hemochromatosis, but it, it certainly um, is worth looking at a ferritin. Um, uh, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, copper of Wilson's disease, a ceruloplasm, autoimmune markers, um, drug levels, and I'll mention PETH. Um, and, and please don't ask me to give you the chemical name, but think of PETH as the equivalent of a hemoglobin A1C um, for alcohol. Um, so if you get an alcohol level, um, somebody hasn't been drinking for 36 hours, it's going to be um, zero. But uh, uh, PETH uh, will be elevated for month or months. Um, so if you have some suspicion about um, alcoholism as a cause of liver disease, um, it's a, a good test uh, to order and is not commonly um, thought of in our armamentarium of lab. Um, next slide, please. Scans, um, ultrasound. Uh, I will make a, a, a push for doing a complete abdominal ultrasound 
um, rather than a right upper quadrant ultrasound, um, mostly because you get to see spleen size. And if there's fluid any place in the abdomen, it's abnormal. So um, uh, a lot of times I'll see patients who just had a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Again, please get a complete um, CT um, and MR and MRCP. Um, MRCP is a really pretty good way at looking at bile duct. And it's a little unusual because MRCP is done without any contrast. Um, and so if you're working up a patient with an elevated alkaline phosphatase, on an MRCP is a great test. Uh, I don't use HIDA scans um, very much um, for the workup of abnormal LFTs. Certainly, if you have a patient who has known gallstones and you're trying to figure out um, if they, in fact, really have uh, cholecystitis, a HIDA scan can be useful. Um, but otherwise, uh, I don't particularly find it a useful test. Um, next uh, slide, please. Non-invasive uh, assessment. Now, this is starting to get a little bit farther than the average primary care doc is using going down this list. But FIB4 is, I think, something that you probably should start learning about. FIB4 is a calculation. You can get a med calculator on your phone um, and is actually a fairly good measure of fibrosis. And therefore, does this patient who has fatty liver, are they at significant risk of having fibrosis associated with their fatty liver? And so calculating a FIB4 can be very useful. Fibrosure and L for proprietary serum-based blood tests, elastography, or, or also known as FibroScan, as the, um, the, the company name, um, is a measure of fibrosis. And um, MR elastography, also we mentioned, are, are tests that are really good, more likely to be ordered um, by uh, hepatologists. But FIB4 is probably something that you should have Easy to get on your phone. Next slide. So let's look at a couple of cases. So we have a 66-year-old male, has a history of hypertension, has a CMP as part of routine lab, and has an elevated ALT and AST. Drinks two or so beers per day, drives a school bus, retired from the police force, history of hypertension, physical exam, has spider angioma, protuberant abdomen, lower extremity edema, platelets is 78,000. This is a cirrhotic who's driving a school bus. Next slide, please. So let's look at his lab. Um, he doesn't have uh, acute hepatitis A. He has uh, a history of previous hepatitis A. So uh, IgM is going to tell you if they have acute disease, the IgG if they had previous disease. He has negative markers um, for hepatitis B, surface antigens negative. Interestingly enough, the core um, uh, is positive and the surface antibody is positive. So that tells us that he previously had hepatitis B. He has hepatitis C antibodies positive, and he has an RNA that's positive. So he has previous hepatitis B, but he has active hepatitis C. Ultrasound shows, of course, liver, big spleen, small amount of free fluid. So here we have a, uh, a guy who's driving a bus. He's at high risk of having encephalopathy. Um, this is somebody who needs to see a hepatologist. Next slide, please. So we think he has advanced hepatitis C. Refer to hepatology. Stop driving the bus. Next slide. Next case. Okay, so this is a young male coming to you from a drug rehab program. He has evidence of previous hepatitis A. He has evidence of previous vaccination to hepatitis B because hepatitis B vaccine only has a surface protein. So their core will be negative, but their surface antibody will be positive. He also has hepatitis C, his antibody is positive. 
and his RNA is positive, he has modest enzymes, normal CBC. Next slide, please. He's too young to have advanced disease unless he has a significant accelerator, HIV or, or alcohol. He's not pregnant, no potential drug interactions, no active hepatitis B, he's immune to A, he's immune to B by vaccine. This patient is somebody who I think that primary care physicians should be treating. I have a talk coming up about uh, hepatitis C treatment by primary care physicians. I think this is really an important opportunity for primary care to be treating patients with uncomplicated hepatitis C. Next slide, please. Okay, fatty liver. Um, we've had a, uh, a change in, in nomenclature on the the people felt that uh, fat or fatty was uh, too stigmatizing. Um, and I'm not arguing with that. Uh, I, I think the name changes are appropriate. Um, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the whole, when you say that to a patient, well, I don't drink. What do you mean non-alcoholic? So getting rid of the non-alcoholic was really a pretty good idea. Um, so we've, we've titled this instead of fatty liver disease, the atotic liver disease, and what we used to call non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we're now going to call metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, if that's not a mouthful. And NASH, the patients who have fat in their liver that's producing inflammation, which has the potential to produce scarring and cirrhosis, went from NASH to MASH. They also added a third group, and that's a patient who has um, excess fat in their liver from both weight and alcohol. And recognizing these patients who are sort of in the middle um, has become very important. Next slide, please. So we have uh, a 56-year-old uh, female. She has uh, mildly elevated AST and ALT. Note that the ALT is greater than the AST. Uh, history of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, elevated cholesterol, on um, metformin, lisinopril, not on a statin because the provider said that they were concerned about uh, abnormal LFTs and starting a statin. A physical exam shows a BMI of 36. CBC is normal. Um, acute hepatitis profile is all negative. Ultrasound shows a dense liver and a normal sized spleen. Again, here's a good example of getting that complete abdominal ultrasound. Next slide, please. So here's this FIB4 thing that we talked about. Again, calculated the FIB4, it's 1.26, which is in a range which is very, very low likely of having a, um, uh, a, uh, a significant fibrosis. Um, but there is a consideration that the patient, in spite of that low FIV4, could have scarring. So uh, this fiber scan, which would be something you likely would get done through your local hepatologist or gastroenterologist, um, and it, it would be good if it would be possible to do that. One thing to consider would be to change their, di their, their diabetes treatment, um, treat with a statin. Unless a patient has fatty liver that has led to cirrhosis, their risk of morbidity and mortality is not from their liver. It's from cardiovascular disease. Statins are safe in patients with chronically low level transaminase elevations. The only patients who really, as far as I'm concerned, should never get statins are decompensated cirrhotics. I, in general, like to be the one to give the cirrhotic a statin, but certainly a patient without cirrhosis can have tr uh, treatment with statins. Patient needs monitored weight loss and exercise. Can't emphasize this enough. 
though there is now just released a specific drug for treating um, patients with steatotic liver disease. Um, and uh, so being aware of that, uh, that new medication is worthwhile and certainly consideration for referral. Next slide, please. So um, patients again with uh, uh, metabolic associated steatotic liver disease are at high risk of morbidity and mortality from cardiovascular disease. In patients without cirrhosis, there's no increased risk for use of statins. Next slide, please. So here's the same, same patient, except the CBC shows a platelet count of 150,000. So right at the bottom of normal, their FIV4 is in an indeterminate range. And so this patient needs a fiber scan to decide if they have um, scarring and decide whether or not they need to be treated more specifically uh, to prevent um, scarring, fibrosis in their liver. Again, switching their diabetes meds, adding a statin, getting them into a weight loss and exercise program. Um, and uh, again, now there uh, would be a potential candidate um, for this newly released medication, uh, which um, we know some about. It's interesting, this drug was released by the FDA. Um, Long-term studies uh, really have not been done. We know it reduces fibrosis and it reduces um, fat in the liver. We don't know that it 100% actually prevents cirrhosis because that's going to take many years to decades to actually determine. Interesting release by the FDA. But as steatotic liver disease is a huge problem, um, they felt it was appropriate to release this med. Next slide, please. And again, the same patient, um, except their platelet count is 95,000. Their FIV4 is clearly in a cirrhotic range. Um, they have a big spleen on ultrasound. They're cirrhotic. They need to be referred. Next slide, please. So um, here's a typical patient in my clinic. They come from the health department. They're, um, they were found to be surface antigen positive. Um, they have no other risk factors uh, for um, hepatitis B. Um, they have a, a, a exposure to a previous uh, hepatitis A. They have a normal CBC, mildly elevated transaminases, hepatitis C antibodies negative. They have active hepatitis B. A, a, a DNA is 33,000, and in some patients in hepatitis B, you will see DNAs into the tens and hundreds of millions. Um, I, I mentioned E antigen and E antibody. Hepatitis B is a lot more complicated than C, and the decision to treat these patients can be fairly complex. I think they should be referred, or at least be treated with uh, a consultation with uh, hepatology. Next slide, please. So likely vertical transmission, decision to treat complicated, has chronic infection, needs hepatitis, a hepatology referral. Next slide, please. This slide, please don't try to memorize this. Um, you will get these slides. Um, but it, it tries to, to emphasize that um, with hepatitis B, it can be complicated. If we look at the second row down, chronic hepatitis B, so their surface antigen can be positive or negative. Their core can be positive or negative. Their DNA can be positive or negative. Yeah, any one of these combinations. And so the decision to treat is based on that and on their E status, complicated. Um, the last two rows, previous B, core positive surface antibody positive versus vaccine, core negative surface antibody positive. So um, this is a, a good slide to um, 
get from the uh, from the slide deck and and have some awareness of the complexity of the markers in B. And I didn't even put E uh, E antigen and E antibody on this slide. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, uh, twenty eight year old female. Okay, complaints of uh, uh, generalized fatigue and arthralgia may have actually been to a rheumatologist, um, comes in, transaminase is very high, 2,200, 3,100, bilirubin is already up, gamma globulin is up, um, autoimmune markers are up, autoimmune hepatitis. This is a patient who is seriously ill and needs significant treatment on an ASAP basis. Next slide, please. Um, similarly, um, here we have a 68-year-old, same kind of complaints, same kind of enzymes, except, wait a minute, they're being treated for uh, lung cancer with a pdl one drug. They have immune-mediated hepatotoxicity from drug a good example of history. Obviously, probably going to be pretty obvious that the patient has lung cancer, but um, I have to ask. Next uh, slide, please. So um, here's uh, a, a good example of uh, a, a patient with um, a anabolic steroid, um, pretty uh, significant Mixed enzymes, AST, ALT, Alclos, bilirubin, 13, okay. Um, hepatitis A, B, and C markers, negative. Um, young uh, a person, I'm going to check a, a herpes. Um, uh, 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 enzymes. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, obviously, overdose, acetaminophen, antibiotics, statins, uh, INH, if you're treating uh, patients with, um, with uh, latent TB, um, antibiotic steroids, antileptics, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, ACE, amiodarone, amiodarone being one of my sticking drugs, to say the least, um, and uh, anti-TNFs, and, and believe it or not, non steroidals and we'll, you'll see um, drug-induced liver disease um, from patients with um, uh, on uh, from non -steroidals. Um Next slide, please. Uh, uh, I think, do we go backwards? Next slide, please. Um, okay, so um, here's a, 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 a patient who you think is likely going to have hepatitis C, comes from a drug rehab program, um, was told to had hepatitis C a year ago, um, treated and had follow-up lab. Um, the RNA became negative, and now they still have abnormal transaminases, uh, denies um, using IV drugs again, and understand that hepatitis C does not give you any immunity to recurrent hepatitis C. So there is no immunity from previous hepatitis C. So as I tell my hepatitis C patients, you can get hepatitis C as many times as you do something stupid. Um, so um, their RNA is negative, so they have an antibody. The hepatitis C antibody is gonna be positive for life. Really consider whether or not um, they have hepatitis C. We check an RNA, the RNA is negative. We get a ferritin. Ferritin is markedly elevated. Next slide, please. And in fact, we check their hemochromatosis genotype, and they have hemochromatosis. Um, or here we have an example where the AST and ALTs, the AST is higher, the ferritin's 900. You, well, maybe they do, but you get a hemochromatosis genotype, and they're not homozygous. Their PETH is 12, and this is alcohol. So, again, even though fer even though the ferritin is pretty high, um, it's not always hemochromatosis. 
and um, always think of uh, alcohol, especially again, when that AST is greater than the ALT. Next slide, please. I include this because I think um, for people in primary care, um, there's always gonna be that concern about when um, is this somebody that I need to get to the hepatologist now? Um, pregnancy, pregnancy, and pregnancy. I, I can't say this enough. While there are benign conditions in pregnancies of abnormal LFTs, there are some that are life-threatening and really, really need to be managed by hepatology. Um, comorbidities. Um, can uh, uh, really affect um, a, a problem. A, a patient with hepatitis A, especially an elderly patient who can't eat because they're just so anorexic and they're diabetic, uh, they, uh, uh, they, are, they have a potential big problems. Um, worsening jaundice and acute hepatitis. So um, you see a patient with hepatitis A, especially um, not very young or very old, most of them will do remarkably well but if they've developed increasing jaundice, something to consider whether or not they should be referred. Any sign of decompensation in liver disease, abnormal bleeding, encephalopathy, um, ascites. Possible drug-induced liver disease with a vital drug. And again, I hate to bring it up, but amiodarone. Um, so, you know, if the patient has significantly abnormal LFTs and they're on a statin, um, Clearly, you can stop the statin and see what happens. But if they're on a, a vital drug, again, an antiarrhythmic like amiodarone, clearly that you're going to need to be trying to figure out what's going on. And doing that in concert with cardiology and hepatology is important. And potential um, uh, ingestion or exposure, um, especially if you think that there's uh, uh, any kind of uh, harm the patients trying to do to themselves with what they're taking. Um, but chemicals, um, I had these guys who clean what's called a, a fracking tower as part of a chemical plant of, 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 and in Houston. And while cleaning this, they decided they would relax for a few minutes and drink a couple of beers inside this fracking tower. And they both got liver failure. Um, so ask about exposures. Uh, next slide, please. So a few added comments. Um, for anybody with any kind of liver disease and especially the patients with steatotic liver disease, check to see if they're immune to hepatitis A and B and vaccinate them. Vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Um, if they have chronic hepatitis uh, uh, C, get them vaccinated for A and B. If they have chronic B, make sure they're vaccinated for A. Um, know the practice high-risk population and test them yearly. Um, again, uh, in my practice, um, a significant number of kids who have been IV drug users, a high recidivism rate, obviously, um, think about yearly testing. Um, Hepatitis C antibody. Every there was originally the CDC uh, uh, said for baby boomers, but now anybody between the age of 18 and 79, and I say 79 plus because as I push towards 79, I don't know that 79 should be a cutoff for anything. Um, and um, find a hepatologist you can curbside and realize that Maven Project has resources specifically um, for hepatology. So. If you need a curbside consult, um, that is certainly an opportunity. Um, uh, next slide. Um, a couple of good um, references. There is a um, uh, Natural uh, Library of Medicine um, NIH uh, site, uh, Liver Talks. It's excellent. I have it on my phone. I use it all the time. Um, trying to decide if uh, a, one of a patient's medications are likely to be um, a cause of 
uh, liver disease. Um, there are other med calculators um, for MELD, which is a uh, assessment of the degree of um, liver disease. FIB4, we talked about, I really think that there is a role for primary care to be loading FIB4 and thinking about uh, calculating a FIB4 in their patients with um, significant uh, steatosis. Um, I often in my practice will get um, a, a orthopedic surgeon sending me a patient um, with liver disease, no liver disease, and asked if I will clear them to have their hip replaced. I don't clear anybody. I give them a mortality risk. And the Mayo Clinic has a calculator um, that you can use. Um, the orthopedic surgeon is not very happy when you send them back some numbers that say that the patient's 30-day um, uh, mortality is this and their um, one-year mortality is that. They want it to be cleared or not cleared. But again, I think there are liability issues um, for that. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is uh, uh, contact information that you all probably are well aware of, the um, Maven um, portal, uh, which uh, will allow you um, to get uh, consults if uh, need be. And uh, Next slide, please. And that's me. Um, and uh, I answer emails. Um, so think about it. Okay. Um, questions and chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Stein. All right. So we do have um, a question in the chat. Uh, given reality of current practice environment, substituting a GLP-1 RA for metformin may not be as easy um, as you say, given difference in price state of uh, pre-auth process, blah, blah, et cetera. Metformin is helpful in metabolic states for uncomplicated cytohepatitis. Would it not, would it not still be helpful? It's not ideal, but as you point out, um, there's no question um, that there is absolutely no question uh, that a cost is a major issue. Um, uh, in, in my um, uh, clinic where uh, patients have no funds, um, we, we are fairly successful in getting a few patients on compassionate um, uh, use uh, for medications. Um, a, a lot of that for hepatitis C, but again, for the hepatitis C, it's a very limited amount. It's eight to 12 weeks. And so that's a whole different scenario. Um, than having somebody on a long-term um, uh, diabetes drug. Um, but you're absolutely right. There is no question. And metformin is has some potential role, but it's certainly not um, to the degree. Uh, but it, again, a metformin is uh, inexpensive. Okay. This is kind of a multi-question question. question. Yes, True or false? Statin-associated liver injury is dose-dependent. Um, had a 76-year-old patient with LDL 190s, restarted at at her vast, Vastatin 40, and ALT went up to 44 from 19. Would you continue at a lower yeah, dose? Up to what? I'm sorry. How high? Uh, uh, the ALT went for up to 44 from 19. Would you continue at a lower dose? Oh, I would continue at that dose. Okay. All right. And I see Dr. Levin has his hand raised. I'm going to unmute him. 